I'd like to begin by saying thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's four thank yous. The first is to the East Longmeadow Cultural Council for funding this event. The second is to the Friends of the East Longmeadow uh, Public Library for also helping to fund the event. The third is to the East Longmeadow Community TV station for uh, recording this. It's going to be broadcast. It's going to be put on YouTube. And last but not least, I want to thank you for being here. So on with the show. How many of you think that you have a green thumb? Raise your hand. <laughs> I'm only seeing three, okay, four. Now, for those of you watching, this is like a tiny percentage of the, how many people are here, about a 20 at least? So how many think that you definitely don't have a green thumb? I'm seeing about an equal number. So, so some of you are kind of in the middle. You kind of have a, okay. Now, let's think about this for a minute. Um, it's almost superstitious to say, I don't have a green thumb, isn't it? I mean, but those of you who think you do have a green thumb, why don't you, Kind of tell the other people what, you know, give them a little confidence, you know, confidence booster, a little encouragement. Any, any volunteers, what do you want to say? I have a fig plant. You have a fig plant, and, fig plant, and that makes you have a green thumb. Okay. No, I have a lot of other things. Okay. I'm really proud of my fig plant. Oh, isn't that a wonderful to have a fig plant? And you have to, of course, bring it inside or, or yeah. bury it. Uh, you know, this is a perennial. But, but we're talking mostly about annuals here. But let, let's, let's talk about what does it take to have a green thumb? Yes. Uh, proper healthy soil, know whether, it like, whether, what, know whether your plant likes sunlight or All right, yeah, healthy soil and know about the, the uh, needs of your plant, whether it needs light, that kind of thing. Any other things people want to say about having a green thumb? Yeah. Certain predator-like bugs that are good and bugs that are bad. I love that. There are certain insects, let's be you know, zoologically correct here, because bugs are only one type of insect. There are certain insects that are really beneficial. And in fact, birds are your allies too, because they'll eat, you know, they'll eat the bad guy insects, right? Who, that might otherwise. So yeah, it's good to know about those allies that you have that are patrolling your garden for you, right? And which is why organic gardening is a good idea, because that we're, now it's safe for those allies to be in your garden, okay? I want to say one more th thing about what it takes to have a green thumb. Enthusiasm, <laughs> interest, right? I mean, it's, it's anything that, I mean, if, if you want to, if you really have a vision, right? I want to do this and you have motivation, nothing's gonna stop you, right? And, and there's so many people who will be eager to share their knowledge with you. And there's so many ways, of course, in this day and age to get that knowledge uh, on the, internet or what have you. And they're, so yeah, neighbors, friends, family, coworkers, you name it. And as soon as you start being generous with your produce, oh my gosh, then it, it really starts to, you know, you really start to not only believe in yourself, but then you start to learn more from other people because then, you know, the sharing just keeps on happening. Okay, so yeah, the, all these plants really need, there's that, they need that soil, right? They need the sunlight, they need water. Um, now, they might need some other things like protection from other animals <laughs> that might make it, want to make a meal of, the, of your plants. We can talk about that later. But uh, what does organic gardening mean? Most people think that it just means you don't use synthetic fertilizers, you know, like the, the come in granules, you buy bags of granules, and, uh, and you don't use any kind of pesticides, herbicides, any, pesticides, anything, okay? But really what it means beyond that cultivating an ecosystem that sustains and nourishes plants and the soil microbes in the soil and the beneficial insects that we mentioned earlier and, and the other beneficial animals. So uh, soil microbes are, are really important. The soil is teeming with life. You're gonna find that out. But first let's talk about the benefits of organic gardening. Well, you've got healthier, more vigorous disease and stress resistant plants. What's not to like about that? Don't you want healthy plants, right? Um, safer and more nutritious produce. That's a huge motivation. You don't wanna be worried about what might be in the food that you're putting in your mouth or you're putting in your children's mouth or whatever. Last but not least, you can save money and time. Why would anyone garden any other way if all of this is true, right? So, uh, Especially, you know, now let's, let's think about how, how healthy organic produce is. What doesn't it have, that you, right? It has more of everything that you want, all right? 
all those wonderful, I mean, nutritionists are still learning more about what's in plants, but whatever, the, you know, the, uh, whatever those vitamins and minerals, fructose and glucose, the antioxidants, phenolic compounds, got them, organic, uh, but, and it has less of what you don't, I mean, you're not growing plants to have water. Uh, you're not, you certainly don't want nitrates and toxic chemicals in those plants. So soil. Now, remember how organic gardening, it's so much of this is about the soil. Look at what's in, if you had, you know, a microscope, in, in, in fact, like an uh, electron microscope or whatever, or any kind, you'd see a lot going on in that soil. You'd see bacteria. You probably never heard of actinomycetes, but it's kind of like fungi, uh, kind of like bacteria. And there is, the soil is just teeming with these guys. Uh, yards and yards of fu fungal filaments, the fungi, uh, in a teaspoon of soil. Algae. Uh, protozoa, you probably remember that from biology class, these things that swim around in the water, they're actually in your soil, believe it or not. And they can swim around in that soil when it's wet. And the nematodes, uh, which they're not quite visible, but they're a lot bigger than the, the protozoa, and they are um, maybe about 20 of them in a teaspoonful, who knew, right? All of that is happening, and of course they're making meals on the, on the ones that are smaller. It's a, it's, a, it's a jungle down there, it's a jungle under our feet. But it's a wonderful jungle because all of that is, they're trading nutrients around and they're making, and their bodies die. And so when their bodies die, all those nutrients are available, and, and, and they poop, right? All, all that stuff is available for your plants. Do you know what you're looking at? Mycorrhizal. Yes, that is correct spelling, by the way. R-R-H, okay. <laughs> but anyway, um, special kind of fungi that team up with plant roots. We're, ta we're talking symbiosis here, all right? We're talking if the plant's roots don't have these thread-like things that you see, you see how they're actually attached to those big giant plant roots? Sometimes they actually go into the plant roots or sometimes they're just surrounding it, okay? Uh, ectomycorrhizal or endomycorrhizal, but either, in either case, what are they delivering to the roots? Just what the roots need. They need water, they need nutrients. Can they get them without the, without the mycorrhizal fungi? Yes, but not nearly as much. Not nearly as much, because those fungi, remember the yards and yards of filaments in every teaspoon? There's no way that the plants can make yards and yards of root hairs in every teaspoon, no way but the fungi can. So they're the delivery system for all the water and the minerals, and they even protect the plant in, uh, from uh, invaders and you know, diseases and that sort of thing. Um, so enhanced nutrient availability, enhanced water absorption, protection from pathogens. So you want to encourage these wonderful mycorrhizal fungi, and here's how to do it. Minimize manure, isn't that interesting? Who would have thought? I mean, some manure is okay, but not too much. And not synthetic fertilizer, what we've been taught was what they really want, but no, that's not what the mycorrhizal fungi want. And minimize digging, especially rototilling. Because, now I'm not saying you can't ever, I mean, if you want to create a garden with rototilling, that is conceivably a way to begin. It's not the only way, which I'll let you, let you know, but it causes compaction, believe it or not. It causes tiller pan because the tines only go so deep and they glaze the surface as they go. It ruins the soil structure, destroys worm tunnels, consumes soil nutrients, displaces the soil biota, all this, this stuff that used to be on top, now is on the bottom and it's all mixed up. Invites weed seeds to grow. Think about it, the seeds are just lurking below this. And if, and if you bring them up with rototilling, ah, here we, we're ready to go, you know? You don't want to give, you don't, don't want to give seeds an invitation to grow. So the benefits, less labor, soil microbes thrive, conservation of soil organic matter, conservation of moisture. And here is an alternative to using a rototiller to start your organic gardening. Just smother the lawn or whatever vegetation it is you want to get rid of, okay? Just smother it. Now you can dig it up and, and you, you know, it's, that's a lot of work. But if you're, if you're patient, if you did this now, for example, okay, then you'd have, a, you'd be ready to go <laughs> next year, okay, for a vegetable garden. Or you'd be ready to go this fall if you want to plant perennials, because it's wonderful to, uh, fall is the best time to plant perennials. And when I, when I say perennials, I'm talking about like those wonderful plants, the native plants, the native wildflowers, the native shrubs that are going to attract, this is, this is what I'm asking you to think, you know, first and foremost when you plant perennials. Not for your, not for eye candy, not the stuff that you love to see, or you know, big, big blooms, whatever. What do the insects need? What do the insects use? And they use native plants, native wildflowers, 
native grasses, native shrubs. And so you could do sheet mulching. What, what is sheet mulching? It's just, like I said, smothering <coughs> with cardboard or six layers of newspaper, uh, ideally. You could use something that's not organic, like a big tarp. That's, that's one way to kill the grass, right? But I like the, the approach of using cardboard, which then decomposes, and then you don't have to worry about. Uh, and, and I don't know, it, it kind of works. Now, that thing on the lower right is called builder's paper. If you have a large area you want to do sheet mulching, you, you can buy builder's paper, just roll it out. It's cardboard, too. Um, what do you put on top of the cardboard or the newspaper? Mulch. That's why it's called sheet mulching. It's also called lasagna gardening, because if you want, you can put a lot more than mulch. You could put compost down there and then mulch, okay? Or you could put layers and layers of all kinds of different things. If you, if you look up this up online, you'll see people have all kinds of different recipes and ways, of, and that's why they call it lasagna gardening. Um, so, uh, and compost, we're, we're gonna talk about how wonderful that stuff is, but so yeah, it, it, and now before I go any farther, you might wanna consider testing your soil before you even begin. What does your soil need? You send a soil sample to UMass Soil Testing Lab, Amherst, Massachusetts, right? UMass Soil Testing Laboratory. They'll give you instructions about how to do it, how to take your sample, and then, and ask for the organic content as well. So then you're gonna get, what's the pH? What are the nutrients? Are there any that are, that are lacking there? Uh, you know, the organic content, all that stuff. You're gonna learn what you're starting with. And if you have any deficiencies, well, before you even put down the barrier layer, you're gonna sprinkle that around on the, on the ground, right? And then that's good. And according to the amounts that will be given to you by the US, UMass Soil Testing Lab, they'll tell, me, tell you how much and what kind of stuff to put down. Okay. And then you put down the barrier layer, the cardboard or newspaper. And then you put down your compost and then mulch as a final layer. Benefits of mulch. Suppresses the weeds. Keeps the soil moist. Keeps the soil cool. Enriches the soil. I can't say enough about how important mulch is. You know, um, I, I was in a, I had my own plot, a community garden, and I used pine needles for mulch, and I'll tell you why I love them in a minute. But anything is better than nothing, and no one else was using mulch, and they were out there watering and watering. It was a hot summer, watering and watering and watering and watering. I never watered my garden, not once, and, and the plants did just fine. I'm not saying that will necessarily work for you, but it did for me. Um, in annual beds, and this is mostly what we're talking about in this program, the and, you know, vegetables that grow, that, you know, that they grow in one year, they're not perennials, right? Grass clippings can work, but not, I would not suggest that as a main mulch. It, they, too many grass clip, too much gra grass clippings are like, they get, uh, they get, they're too dense and they can't breathe. And uh, so straw is much better. Shredded leaves are much better. And they don't have to be shredded, by the way, they can just be leaves. And then the pine straw, which is the same thing as pine needles, by the way. That's what pine straw is. Those are, those are my favorite types of mulch for per annual gardens. Um, I don't recommend wood chips uh, because they, they can, um, uh, it's called nitrogen robbery. Nitrogen gets kind of the, the bacteria, because the wood chips have so little nitrogen, the bacteria use all the nitrogen in the soil to, to decompose the, the wood chips, and then the plants don't get enough. Um, now, if you're starting perennial beds, just briefly, some of those same things work fine too, shredded leaves, pine straw, but then pine bark, sawdust, wood chips are all fine for perennial beds. Chip branch wood is wonderful stuff. There's also um, chipped hardwood bark is a good mark, a good mulch for perennial beds. So let me talk about pine straw mulch a little bit, pine needles. What's good about them? They do not make the soil acidic. Many people think that, oh no, you can't do that. It'll make the soil, nope. Look it up online. Okay, that's a myth. Break down slowly, that's an advantage, right? Because if it breaks down fast, then you don't have any, any mulch yet left and you have to reapply sooner. Easy to handle, lightweight, economical, easy to apply, breathes well, doesn't compact, allows for water infiltration, doesn't float and wash away, uniform color and fine texture, looks great. What's not to like about pine needles, okay? So save your leaves because you might decide to use leaves for mulch. And also when they decompose, they become wonderful uh, stuff. They become compost basically, right? Uh, and so they in increase water retention in soils by over 50%, provide fantastic habitat for earthworms and other soil life. By the way, when you do sheet mulching, one of the things you'll discover is that earthworms 
love it. You will not believe how many earthworms will be attracted to your sheet mulching. And like if you just pick up the cover a little bit, you know, like peek underneath what's happening, you'll see them. They just, uh, they'll be multiplying like crazy, which is just what you want because earthworms do a great job of excavating and creating tunnels in the soil and adding fertility and giving soil good texture. Um, but yeah, oh, and something else I want to say about leaves. You don't have to rake leaves. I mean, it's all a, an aesthetic. But do we want to think about aesthetic or ethic? Do we, in other words, do we want an ethical aesthetic? I think we do. And an ethical aesthetic says, please don't rake the leaves, at least under trees. Think about this. The caterpillars uh, descend from the canopy in the fall. And if they land in the, in the lawn, forget it. There's no place for them to hide over winter. But if, they, if there's leaves there, that's a refuge for the caterpillars. And, uh, and other insects, okay? So at least in, under the canopy of your tree, c consider leaving the leaves there. Cover crops, I'm not gonna get into this in, in detail. I have to confess I've never done it myself, but some advanced gardeners, instead of just leaving the soil um, idle over the winter, why not pr plant something that'll improve, this so improve it even more? Gardeners are always thinking about how can I improve the fertility and cover crops do that. Some of them add nitrogen, they, and they suppress weeds, they build, you know, the idea is let them grow, and then, you, and then they die, or you cut them back before they seed or whatever, and then their bodies then become more of the fertility that you're wanting in your garden. And now let's talk about compost. And let's, let's get some terms straight, by the way. There's soil, there's mulch, and there's compost. I want to make sure you're, you don't confuse those. Soil has minerals in it. Like, you know, rock breaks down into sand and silt and clay. You know, the clay is the finest particle of, of rock. But compost doesn't have any minerals in it. Because if you think about it, you're putting food scraps or, you know, gar you know yard waste or whatever in your compost pile. It's, it's degrading, but you're not putting rocks in there of any size. So there, there's no way for those minerals to, to get into compost. And that's fine. Comp that, you, compost doesn't need to have minerals in it. But let's just, you know, when, when you think about whether you might buy something at the store, they sell you, sometimes they sell you bags of soil, okay? You might need soil, but I'd like to suggest that you probably don't and that you can just improve your soil with compost. The soil already has the mineral component and all that. Um, so anyway, uh, and, and the mulch, just to, to finish things out, the mulch is the upper layer that protects uh, you already saw the, the functions of the, you know, protects everything below. The, the soil and the, and the compost and whatever you've got. And usually the compost is mixed into the soil eventually, right? Here's what to know about compost. Now, I, once upon a time, I didn't know that you were supposed to do anything but just put kitchen scraps. I thought kitchen scraps alone would do just fine. Well, no. And what I found is it was a stinking mess. In, you know, if, if you put them in a, in a bucket outside or whatever. And that's because kitchen scraps are all fresh in the green category, high nitrogen, and you need three or four times the amount of browns by volume or equal amounts by weight because the greens are so much heavier, all right? If you keep in mind that, so every time you go out to the compost pile or, or a bin or whatever you're doing for, to, to create your compost, after you put those kitchen scraps in, or any green yard waste or whatever, yard scraps, then you add on top, uh, well, what's, what's brown? Cardboard, you know, uh, um, non-recyclable cardboard works fine. Um, fall leaves, pine needles, not so great because they take longer to, to um, but yeah, uh, the, the, be the best things are, uh, you know, whatever, whatever's on hand is the best. Okay, organic gardeners are really good at uh, accessing things and uh, finding out how to, how to get what they need without buying it. And, and isn't this interesting list here of the greens that are high nitrogen? It's not just uh, grass clippings and vegetable and fruit scraps and you know, perennial and annual plant trimmings, but you know, weeds, when you're weeding, crushed eggshells is a green. They, don't, it, they take forever to decompose, but coffee grounds and tea bags. Some people think, oh no, I can't do that. That'll make the soil acidic. Wrong again, another myth. Coffee grounds are just fine for compost. Um, animal manures, but uh, you know, just be, go light on the animal manures. Urine is a great high nitrogen uh, substance, folks. 
Uh, don't need to waste it. Uh, <laughs> seaweed, wonderful stuff. You don't, it doesn't get any better than seaweed, all the different minerals and stuff that are in seaweed. Um, we'll talk about that later, pond weeds and algae. So be creative, all right? And there are a lot of different ways you can do your compost containers. The, here's a triple, here's a double. The, the advantages to a double or triple is you can, when one part is finished, then you can start dumping in the other part and then use the part that's finished instead of always putting fresh, comp fresh uncomposted stuff on top of the pile that you're trying to use. Um, but, you know, whatever you've got. Um, and again, you can use whatever you've got. If you have cinder blocks, why not use cinder blocks? You can get compost pretty quickly in, a, in about a couple of months, really, if you turn it regularly and keep it moist, okay? If you just add water every couple of weeks, it's still pretty, you know, three, three months or so. If you do nothing at all, you're still gonna get, you know, compost happens, right? Uh, if, if you almost never turn it, uh, it's still ready to use in six or 12 months. Ever heard of red wriggler worms? You can compost indoors. It's called vermicomposting. And this stuff is high quality compost. All the people, you know, uh, folks who do this really sing the praises of the compost that vermicom these little worms can make inside. Um, be and what, here's what they need. Oxygen, darkness, warmth, bedding soaked and wrung out, which is, can be any of the, the, those things, aged straw, fall leaves, shredded cardboard, newspaper, paper towels, egg cartons, brown paper. They need food scraps that are partially decomposed. They don't want fresh food scraps. So you can either freeze them, and that helps to decompose them, or, or, or just, you know, be creative. Chop, blend, or frozen. And just a handful of soil, and they'll be happy. And you can have a vermicomposting bin that doesn't smell at all, even under your sink. Isn't that something? So there's more to learn on the internet, of course, but I just want to plant that seed in your mind that in the middle of winter, you can be composting. And speaking of these, those red, those red wriggler worms are not earthworms. They are smaller, they're, not, they're skinnier, and do you know what? They live in my compost bin. I got one of those black earth machines. They just showed up. I, know, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't bring it, and they're just living there. And so, <laughs> you know, if, if you're a, if you're in Amherst at some time and want some <laughs> red wrigglers, just tell, let me know and I'll give you some. I'm not using them. I, I don't use them indoors. I, I just you know, bring everything outdoors. But anyway, uh, it's interesting that they, are, they somehow found my compost pile. You know. um, comfrey. I wonder if you've heard of comfrey before. This is a kind of a large fuzzy leaf and they call it the green manure. Just look at the NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and compare that with manure, which you're used to thinking of as really high class NPK, right? Right? Uh, of fertilizer. And it's got more nitrogen than any of these uh, except for rabbit manure, more phosphorus than any except for the chicken and rabbit, and the potassium blows the rest of them away. That's what you get when you grow comfrey leaves. So what does that tell you? If you grow comfrey, which is a perennial, you can cut and come again. You can cut, the leaves come back again. Now you've got these green leaves that are ready to work for you. Liquid comfrey fertilizer. Ever heard of uh, nettle tea? In Britain, they know about nettle tea, which is not boiled, by the way. It's just like, what you, what you do is you cut, chop up the leaves, you leave them to soak, and after, you know, after a while, they're going to stink to high heaven because that's what happens when you put <laughs> any plants in water, right? But that's okay. You just keep it covered. You chop them up. And then do, once, you know, uh, in a matter of weeks, uh, dilute with water because that's strong stuff. Dilute it one to ten. And now you have a fertilizer that you can just gift to your plants. Isn't that a cool idea? So you do, all, all you have to do is get the comfrey. And if you, know, if you know someone who has, just ask around. You'll, you'll figure it out. If, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. Nettle is another wonderful s source of nutrients. And um, it's the same idea. Now, a stinging nettle, by the way, is a delicious and highly nutritious plant. How in the world are you going to eat stinging nettle, you might wonder? Well, you harvest it carefully <laughs> with, with gloves or whatever. 
And as soon as it's cooked, it's fine. It's not going to sting you if it's cooked. As soon as it's dried, it's fine. And you can make a hearty nettle tea, which is very nutritious for humans such as us, right? But, and, and in fact, the nettle greens, I can testify they are delicious. And there's not much uh, on the planet that's more nutritious than nettle greens for humans. Okay, I think it's more nutritious than anything except seaweed. <laughs> all right, so, but it's all, you know, it, it, it's good for us and it's good for the plants too, just like comfrey is, all right? Um, did you know that plants have tiny little mouths on their upper and lower surfaces called stomata? Every, stomate is the singular of that. Every little stomate is a pair of lips that closes and opens. It closes on a hot day so that the leaf will not dry out. No, or, and the water, you know, the, the, it'll, the leaf will wilt otherwise, but when, on a moist day or when it's raining, those stomata are open and they are drinking whatever is on the surface of the leaf. Think about that. It's almost like they're roots in that case. They're serving as, as aerial roots. And in fact, they're getting the nutrition much more directly than through the roots. If you think about like irrigating you know, or putting some of that liquid fertilizer around the roots. Well, the plant roots will get some of it, but not all of it. But if you're spraying the leaves and those stomata are drinking, you're getting a lot more. The plant, if you ask the plant, they're saying, oh yes, give it to us on the leaves. We, we like that, right? Now look at all those ways to make a foliar spray. And not surprisingly, the comfrey, the nettle, the thistle, those plants that I just talked about, that's one way to make a foliar spray. So instead of, instead of putting it irrigating on the, you know, the liquid fertilizer on the soil around the plants, you can spray the leaves with it. But you can also use any weeds. You know, the plants will be, these are just, you know, high performing weeds, but any weeds will do. You could use um, kitchen waste in a bucket. You could use uh, com compost itself, putting that in a bucket. And that becomes a kind of a, you know, a co compost tea, um, a manure. Uh, but the best of all are anything that comes from the sea. And you can buy, you know, it's, it's pretty pricey, of course. You can, you can buy this, these products uh, at nurseries uh, that have seaweed or, you know, uh, seaweed meal or fish meal or whatever. And there, there's a reason why gardeners love that this stuff is because it, it, it beats everything. Um, Next time you go to the ocean, maybe uh, bring back a few bagfuls, bags full of seed, <laughs> seaweed or if you don't feel it's um, taking from the environment or whatever. Um, so here's some tips about foliar spray, recipes, and application. Uh, I'm not going to take a lot of time to read everything on these slides. Just uh, uh, if you want more information, uh, if you want this information sent to you, I can. But um, just, you know, uh, some, some uh, common sense kinds of things. You don't do it right when it's about to rain or whatever. Um, Epsom salts is another little trick that gardeners in the know are aware can really give your plants a boost, especially tomatoes and peppers, because it, they love that extra nitrogen and phosphorus. They, they has a lot of magnesium, which might be a deficiency. It improves the flower and fruit set. Also roses, azaleas, and rhododendrons will appreciate Epsom salts. So here's what you do. One tablespoon Epsom salt granules around each transplant or in the hole when transplanting. Okay, that's it. Um, or you can use as a foliar spray. One more time, foliar spray, right? One tablespoon per gallon of water every month when blooms first appear. So these are, these are tricks of the trade. All of a sudden, you know, you, you didn't think you had a green thumb and now you're learning how to have a super green thumb with these, some of these tips here. Um, so you're, you can irrigate with Epsom salt solution. And woodchucks don't like it. So you can sprinkle around the garden perimeter to repel woodchucks. <laughs> I'll get to, you know, I'll, be, I'll tell you more about woodchucks later. In fact, I'll tell you right now. Fences are one way to deal with them. Uh, and then so that not only Epsom salts, ammonia soaked rags, soiled cat litter, they hate it. Okay, if you put it in their holes, rotten eggs, castor oil, chili pepper, it, you know, all that stuff in, in their holes. If you know where their holes are, maybe they'll move out. Sprays also work, you know, on the, foliage or in the garden itself. There are commercial organic deterrent, deterrents, but also anything in the, these are all in the mint family. Lavender, catmint, sage, thyme, rosemary, oregano, lemon balm, anything in the mint family, which all mints have square stems. You ever notice that? 
Okay, little, little biology lesson. It's good to learn this kind of stuff. Get to know what a mint is uh, because they, uh, well, for one reason, woodchucks don't like them, but you plant them. And there are these other you know, motion devices, motion detectors, uh, <laughs> thick molasses, netting, of course, over the holes uh, plugged with rocks. That might discourage them. Or you could give them what they like elsewhere, and right? And instead of doing, making war on them, give them what they want, and then hopefully, you know, you can try it, right? Because there are dis disadvantages to all the other, you know, extra cost, extra fuss, whatever. And you might just enjoy watching them if they're staying away from your garden. Deer, they, you've got to put up a high fence, eight feet tall, if, if you're expecting the fence to do it. I have heard, by the way, that if you put a wire right about here, like maybe a, a yard up, uh, and, you know, a fence, uh, just a single wire, like fishing wire, whatever, They'll walk, they won't see it, they'll walk into it and it's, they won't, don't know what to do. Even though they could easily jump over it, it doesn't occur to them because they don't know what's happening. They can only jump over something that they can visually see, oh, I can jump over this. That's what I've heard. It might work. You know, and sure is cheaper than putting up an eight feet tall fence. Um, Irish spring soap, they don't like it. <laughs> uh, sprinkle those cubes in the garden, they don't like it, okay? Bags of human hair, who would have thought? Commercial organic repellents. Okay, dogs, they don't like that. Saturated rags, uh, bone, blood meal, bone meal, exotic animal manure, et cetera. Okay, all those might help, but sometimes deer get used to it. Sometimes the deer might even be drawn to the smells because they know, oh, that's a garden. Someone's, <laughs> someone's trying to protect something. Um, and of course, the rain will wash them away. So how about fencing for rabbits? At least two feet tall, and you have to bury it, and then bring the fencing out underneath at least three to six inches away from the garden so that they can't burrow underneath. Repellents that work, coffee grounds, cayenne, pepper, soap again, human hair again, garlic, ammonia, vinegar. And, and also think about, well, what, what would they like? Maybe they, you could just give them more of what they like, <laughs> which is, you know, anything that's young and tender, they love. Parsley, greens, lettuce, beans, daisies, carrot tops. Sometimes squirrels will bother your tomatoes. They'll just take little bites out of your tomatoes. Why? Because they're thirsty. So if you have maybe a bird bath or two, maybe they won't bother your tomatoes. All right? Um, there are also things that they don't like. Chili pepper, garlic, vinegar, peppermint oil. And sometimes blue jays, crows, starlings, and grackles can be a nuisance. Good old scarecrows, right? Or other... Uh, devices that you see on, these, um, on this list here. Now, let's get back to earthworms. Remember those good old earthworms? Not the regular red wrigglers, but the ones that show up when you're doing your, um, when you're doing your sheet mulching, and, and you, they're just there anyway. If you rem dig and remove one square foot of garden soil seven inches deep, and then do a census, count the worms in that soil, and if you have 10 or more, you're doing okay. If you have less, um, maybe it's not well-drained enough. Maybe there's not enough organic matter. Maybe the pH is off. It'll give you a little clue to, to you know, do some sleuthing to find out what's the matter. Why don't you have so many earthworms? Soil pH. Let's talk about soil pH. Seven is neutral. So, uh, pH of seven is neutral. Anything below seven is acidic. Anything above seven is basic or alkaline or sweet, all those are kind of, and sour is the, you know, is the acidic. Now, this is why it matters, this little chart here. Um, you can see that the sweet spot, <laughs> I don't mean base now, I'm uh, basic, I just mean the, where the plants can absorb nitrogen more in this range, okay? They can absorb phosphorus more in this range, and that's what this soil pH is all about. You don't want it too high, or too low because then the plants have difficulty absorbing the nutrients that are in the soil. So uh, if you want to find out about your soil, you can get a very cheap soil pH. And again, the, the UMass Soil Testing Lab will tell you the, the pH in addition to everything else. But if, if all you want to know is pH, it's easy to get one of these things and find out. Uh, just add a little soil and then add the little chemical, add the water, and it'll give you, by the color, it'll, you match what the soil pH is. Here's a cool thing. If you have some red cabbage, you can test for soil pH, <laughs> okay? Simmer four to six red cabbage leaves in two cups of water for 10 minutes. 
and then add your garden soil to that, and it'll turn color according to how much. And this is a fun science thing to do with, the, with kids, right? Wouldn't that be fun? Now, not all plants are created equal when it comes to soil pH. <clears throat> you can see, however, that everything on this list will do fine in a pH of 6 to 6.5, which is slightly acidic. Everything on this list will grow in 6 to 6.5. But look at this, asparagus, beets, and cabbage, they can take it all the way up to 8. Peas and spinach, all the way up to 7.5. But all these plants are more picky. They want it right between 6 and 7, right? Right between 6 and 7. They don't want it more acidic. They don't want it more uh, basic. And so, uh, in, in general, that's what you want your soil to be, is between 6 and 7, except for eggplant and uh, potatoes, which like, basic, which like more acidic soil, they want it under 6.5. But everything else up to, up to 7 is fine. So if the soil is too acidic, you add lime or wood ashes or compost because compost kind of neutralizes it. I once added wood ashes because I had a wood-burning stove. Too much of a good thing. I kept on putting my wood ashes out there. I, did, I just put too much. You know, it stands to reason. There's, all, you know, there's, a, uh, there's a, an amount that's, that's appropriate and an amount that, that just exceeds, that, it, that it, it, be, it became too basic. So I had to kind of go the other way. Uh, if the soil is too basic, you can add sulfur or Epsom salts. <laughs> that might be a kind of expensive way to do it. Or again, compost. How about that? Compost is the solution to both problems. It just brings it uh, back to that sweet spot. Compost is great for so many things. If you want to add wood ash, uh, that uh, uh, has more nutrients than lime. We, you know, you can purchase lime at a garden supply store, but uh, hardwood ash has more of the nutrients that those plants want. Uh, you can even use wood ash to control snails and slugs by sprinkling it around the base of plants. Um, other slug deterrents, by the way, anything dry, dusty, or scratchy, lime, diatomaceous earth, cinders, coarse sawdust, gravel, and sand. That's just an aside since we're talking about slugs. Now, remember I said about how there's minerals in the soil and the biggest particles of minerals are the sand. Uh, than, other than, of course, the pebbles and rocks. But, um, but in terms of you know, the texture, we're talking about the, the sand, silt, and clay. And what you want, this is the sweet spot called loam. Loam has about equal amounts of sand and silt, but not too much clay, right? In other words, less than uh, 30 or, or so percent uh, clay. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's no longer loam or it's a... It's a kind of a loam, like clay loam or whatever. But uh, so uh, how do you find out your soil's texture? Dig a sample, put about two inches of soil in a quart jar, and let it settle. And um, oh, and you also add the dish, dishwasher detergent, borax or calgon. Uh, shake the jar for five minutes and measure after, after a while. And it might take a while for that clay to settle down. It might take days. But finally, you'll be able to just see on the jar itself, what are the percentages? Because what's at the bottom is, the heaviest is what? Sand. Yeah. Remember, the clay, it'll, it'll take a while for it even to settle out. That's the top. The clay is the top, the silt is the middle, the sand is the bottom. Another way to test it is to see if, how well you can make a ribbon. The longer ribbon you can make, the more clay, right? It's, you'll feel like you're a potter, you know, making something <laughs> with clay, okay? So th this is a handy way to find out, uh, you know, just by doing the ribbon test. Now, the m biggest problem that many people face um, with their soil is soil compaction. What ha how does soil become compacted? People walking on it, uh, you know, cars driving or whatever, you know? Uh, the more traffic of any kind, the more compacted over time that soil can get. And of course, construction is a, can, can be a compaction event. Uh, walking in your garden, especially if it's wet, that will compact the soil too. So don't. And in fact, try not to walk in your garden at all, wherever the plants are growing. How are you going to do that? Well, you can put little flagstones wherever you plan to step, right? And, um, 
And that's where you'll walk. Flagstones or mulch, you know, wood chip mulch or something, a path, you know, be creative or whatever works for you. But have a designated place where you're going to walk and then just, you know, promise the plants, I'm not going to walk on your soil. And they will, be, they will like you for that. They will appreciate that. So, uh, by, and if you have compaction, you can remove it and replace. You know, you can just take that out and put in soil that's not compacted. You could also bury it with, um, you know, just put the soil on top. Or you can amend with organic matter. Again, compost. <laughs> compost does everything, doesn't it? Or if you have professional help like this, and if you can figure out how to, how to find a broad fork or, or order one or something, you could manually uh, dig holes in that soil and, and make it less compacted. I would like to put in a word for drip irrigation because it's a wonderful way to make absolutely sure that the plants will get the water that they need. Okay? Uh, delivers water directly to the root zone of a plant. You don't waste it on all the plants that you don't want, like the weeds or whatever. Um, so, uh, and you can set a timer up to it, and so it'll d go just as long as it needs to go. Uh, here's another way to aim the water where you want it to be instead of having one of those, you know, what, the sprinkler system that just goes everywhere. But if you, you know, aim the water, this way the, the leaves don't get wet. And the best, if you're going to water the plants when the leaves get wet, the best time to water, by the way, is in the morning. Because then it gives the leaves a chance to dry out before nighttime comes. And, you, and if the wet leaves are wet by nightfall, uh, there's more of a chance to, for the mold or, you know, for, for diseases to come. Of course, sometimes it rains at night, and that, I'm not talking about that. But um, anyway, uh, what, what if you're going to go away for a couple of weeks? You're going out of, out of the country or something. Oh no, my tomato plants, I'll have to hire someone to water them. Although you could also just bury a clay pot full of water right next to them. And clay is porous, isn't it? And, and cover that so that, that any, any time you put water out, there's a chance that some unfortunate animal will you know, fall in and drown. So cover it and also it'll evaporate quick, more quickly. Isn't that an interesting you know, wicking for irrigation? Uh, speaking of moisture, one of these things only costs about 20 bucks, a moisture meter, and it might be worth every penny if you're a serious gardener. Um, because why water if you don't need it? You can just stick that thing in and find out. Um, and it also even measures light and uh, pH. So you're trying to decide where to start a garden. Six plus hours a day is optimal, at least six hours. Okay, that's, that's defined as, you know, when you see full sunlight, they're talking six hours. That doesn't mean it has to be six, all day sunlight, it just means six hours, okay? Uh, you don't want it where standing water is gonna happen with any regularity, okay? So fill in or avoid standing water. If you're doing it on a slope, uh, south facing is, or west facing, or you know, that would be better than north facing. North facing, you wouldn't get as much sun. You want to test the soil uh, when you decide on site selection. You want a place that has some circulation, but not too much. <laughs> you want wind protection as well. You want it near where you live. You, want it, you, you're, you might think that you're going to visit that garden way out in the backyard, but you're not going to see it. You're not going to notice it nearly as much, and just for convenience sake. So you want it fairly near where you live or where you, you're normal. You, know, you, you see it, right? And near your water source, near your compost. And, and uh, you want to avoid that com uh, impact, you know, the, con uh, the compacting and all that. There are some shade tolerant plants that don't need six hours. They need three to six. And these in general are the plants that are grown for their stems, leaves, or buds, not for their fruit, but for the stems, leaves, or buds. For example, okay? In fact, some even prefer shade like Tatsoi, mint, chervil, coriander, parsley, they prefer partial shade. And there are some plants also that do better in, you know, like you, you plant tall plants so that they can grow in the shade through the summer months. Because some, sometimes it depends on when in the season you're talking about. They might do, do fine in the spring, but when it's really, sun's really hot in the middle of the summer, they might want some more shade. But anyway, um, these plants that have 
asterisks, okay, you'll get a smaller yield than if you had six hours of sun, but you can still get a yield of broccoli or cabbage or cauliflower, peas or potatoes, rhubarb, you know, turnips, carrots, kohlrabi, beets. You can still get some. You just won't get as many, but some is better than none. Keep in mind when, you, uh, th when you're thinking about your so where you, where location of your garden, you don't want it too near a tree. Even if the tree is not shading it, doesn't mean that those roots won't find the soil. And as when the roots find the soil, you're, you're, gonna be fi you're gonna find that you're giving all this wonderful organic matter to the roots and the roots will love it. <laughs> and they'll, and they'll, they will grow more and more into the garden. And that's not what you want. You don't want tree roots in the garden. And notice how, uh, you've probably noticed in the woods when a tree has fallen over, whoosh, that huge plane of roots, you, you see how far those roots have gone. Right? So you, you know, often way beyond what the crown is, okay? As you, as you can see this illustration. So stay well away from trees when, when you're planting or a raised bed. So, you know, a raised bed, uh, tree roots won't be able to invade the raised bed. Now, if you have limited space, here's some ideas. Use transplants, you know, get that, get that space going quickly. Grow productive, space-efficient, extended harvest crops. There they are, okay? They'll, they'll really give you a lot for that limited space. Grow several plantings of short season crops. There they are. You can, you know, instead of just having one harvest, you can harvest and then plant them again. Grow compact crops that don't take up much space. Grow specialty crops, because after all, there's no point in growing something that's easily bought in the grocery store for very little money, if, you know, why not grow what you like and then you're really like giving yourself extra value. Grow vertical with trellises, that stands to reason. Things that are vines take up a lot less space. Cut and come again salad greens, another way to, okay. And remove plants that are no longer productive to make room for new plantings. We think we we always think about spring, or we tend to think of spring as the time to plant. You can plant any time of year, if it's appropriate for that plant at that time of year, and if you're you know diligent about watering and all that. Um, stagger plants and interplant different crops. Let's talk about these ideas. Here are the typical you know, the seeds in a seed packet, uh, and, and the, the, the seed packet instructions say, okay, you sow six inches apart, rows three feet apart, okay, I've got to do what the seed packet says, and that's what you've got. But wait a minute, what if you have a bed like this, you don't need to have all those plants three feet apart, do you? You can put them all six inches apart. And then you've got a lot more plants in a given space uh, and don't forget also, you're going to be walking up and down here if, if they're uh, rows. So uh, in, instead, why don't you have your path going around? If this is a, that's, and that's one of the advantages of raised beds, you're never going to walk in a raised bed anyway, right? So think, but, but think of your garden as a raised bed, even if it's not. And then you, you can get a lot more. In fact, in, instead of having them in ro neat rows and columns like that, stagger them. You can get more that way, can't you? Then if, you know, if they're at a diagonal like this, you can fit more, just the geometry of it makes sense, doesn't it? You can fit more in the bed. And here's what interplanting is all about. Those tomato plants are gonna take a while to get big, aren't they? You buy the, either you start them from seed or you buy the starts from a nursery or something. Why not plant smaller plants that are gonna mature fast in the spaces around them and use that space? Right, and then um, oh, you know you can harvest them even before they start to get shaded by the taller plants. So here's some examples of interplanting. The larger, slow-growing vegetables are here, okay, including the tomatoes, as I mentioned. But there are a lot more that are larger and slow-growing, and you can plant, you can surround them then with these smaller, fast-maturing vegetables: the lettuce, mesclun, spinach, beets, kale, Swiss chard, and radish while you're waiting for those other plants to get big. You're using the same space. Uh, so here's some examples, spinach and tomatoes. Okay, spinach grows before tomatoes. Onions and cabbage. Okay, onions mature 
Uh, and, then, and then the cabbages will shade the onion bulbs, keeping the soil cool, cool and moist. Here is a cool thing to have. Uh, you, re you really want one of these on hand to help you plan your garden, because as I said, spring is not the only time to plant your vegetables. And you, you'll also need to know when is it okay to put those seeds in the ground? Is it too, it, you know, some plants you can go, some plants you could, you could plant like a month ago. Here we are, March um, 12, right? You could have planted, um, uh, or just, you know, easily, um, a lot of those cold season. Uh, so plant in early spring peas, radishes, lettuce, spinach, carrots, and beets. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if there are some frosts. Uh, those, those plants can handle that but there are some other plants that you need to wait. So all of that is, uh, all that information is here. It, it shows you when to plant, how long uh, it'll take for maturity before you're harvesting, right? Uh, for any given plant. And then, oh, I can, you can plan ahead. I, I'll, let me put something right there in that space, <laughs> in that time space, right? So here's spring and fall plantings. Super hardy crops, plant as soon as, as ground is suitable, leek, onion, parsley, pea, spinach, and shallots. Hardy crops, two to four weeks before last frost, <clears throat> lettuce, radish, etc. Average crops, one to two weeks before last frost, there they are. Okay. Tender crops, wait until the last frost for beans, corn, and squash. And the heat-loving crops, you have to wait even longer. Uh, Cucumber, eggplant, melon, peppers, sweet potatoes, tomatoes. You want to really wait until that soil has warmed up. And then the spring and fall plantings. Four months before the first frost, you can plant the leeks. Now we're, we're talking about later in the, uh, in the year, right? And, and as, as fall is coming on. Three months before spring and fall plantings, okay? Chinese mustard, lettuce, peas, and spinach, and turnips, two months before. And in fall for an early spring crop, you can put lettuce, spinach, and parsley seeds in the ground in the fall, and then they'll come up in the spring for you. Now, it, you can uh, push the season a little bit by giving your plants some protection. This is a milk container hot cap, and uh, here's how it works. You just, you know, if you know that there's going to be a frost, you put one of these things on your, tent, on your plant that you don't want to get frostbitten, and then you um, protect it that way because it'll, it'll contain the heat and then you lift it up the next morning. <laughs> Looks like we've got liftoff here <laughs> all by itself, yeah. <laughs> I mentioned raised garden beds, and he, people often really love raised garden beds. For one thing, you know, it's a little bit high. I mean, it, it may not be much higher, but some, some people do make them quite high, and there are ways to do that. But in any event, you know, it keeps, keeps you out of the bed. It keeps the, you know, animals and all. Comfortable and accessible, keeps out animals. Um, no need to remove the rock, sand, clay, etc., because you're, what you're putting in there is, you know, whatever whatever soil you want, and you can control the watering, and it looks good. Only only disadvantage really is that if you change your mind, it's going to be a it's going to be a chore to deconstruct and move that uh, right. Hard to move, and also they can dry out a little bit faster. Here are some options for raised garden beds. Again, uh, you know, be resourceful. Use what you've got. Be creative. Or you can just build it. Keep in mind, of course, that it's going to rot after a while. Most, most wood, uh, even, even if it's super, there are some woods that are more, resist, more, more rot resistant. The cedar, the black locust, uh, anyway. And here are those uh, raised, really super raised beds that I mentioned. You can get them if you want to invest in galvanized raised beds. If you do that, you might want to fill a good part of them with things like branches and, you know, like a filler. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be compostable, but it's, a, it's expensive to fill, you know, with garden soil or a, a soil mix, you know, a, a, a big raised bed like that. So one part topsoil to one part compost is the, is the recipe you want. And you can, of course, add organic matter just as you would to your normal. Uh, in fact, you should keep on adding. Every time, you, with, every time that you take a bit, uh, plant and harvest it, you're removing nutrients, and you want to return nutrients. Think of it that way. Keep, you know, keep putting back. And I'd like to recommend Joe Lample. Isn't that an interesting name? L-A-M-P. 
apostrophe L. <laughs> Joe Lample, grow like a pro, joegardner.com. Also, Epic Gardening, epicgardening.com, Kevin Esperito. Um, you might find other people who you, but there are a lot of, boy, there's so much information on the web, you know, YouTubes you can watch or, um, or information that's just written down. But I, I do recommend these two guys. Um, if you're interested in perennial vegetables, um, there are many perennial vegetables, by the way. Uh, you might not know what they are, but Eric Tonesmeyer will tell you. He lives in um, Southampton, by the way, and I, I know him well. So he's a great guy. Uh, and uh, Landscaping with Fruit, Lee Reich has written that, that book. A lot, to, you know, a lot to consider about, but I'm, I'm focused on annuals in this presentation, but I just want to let you know, of course, uh, it's a, why not think about both, right? So I would like to introduce crop rotation, the concept of crop rotation to you. Uh, what this means is that you don't always plant the same plant in the same place. You don't always put your tomatoes right here. You don't always put your cucumbers right here. You move them around because that prevents the buildup of soil-borne pests and diseases. Any pests and diseases that, are, that have gotten a little foothold on that plant, if you don't, you know, they'll be ready and waiting in the soil. They'll be <laughs> lying in ambush, so to speak. Uh, speaking of which, at the end of the season for some plants like squash and tomatoes, don't, um, don't leave the soil covered with mulch. Leave it exposed, and that, uh, so that kind of keeps things more, um, you know, it, it, uh, the, the, those pests and those diseases are more exposed. Um, so, and the replenishment of soil nutrients, nutrients is the other reason. So uh, some, there are some crops that are heavy feeders, the leaf and root crops, okay, which are primarily in these families. Uh, there are light feeders, which are root crops and legumes. Legumes actually, um, actually enrich the soil, uh, so they're definitely not. They're definitely light feeders. They don't. They don't need much at all because they're creating. The, the, they're fixing. There's there's nitrogen in the air, not just oxygen, not just carbon dioxide. There's nitrogen in the air that bacteria are able to convert into nitrates, which are available. You know, that's the NPK of, of fertilizers. That nitrogen is so important to plants. But most plants can't grab that nitrogen from the air. But the bacteria that live in the nodules of roots of legumes, when I say legumes, I'm talking about peas and beans and alfalfa and all that, they are able to fix that atmospheric nitrogen, to grab that nitrogen and use it for fertilizer. So it, it makes sense to, to uh, when you start with the heavy feeders, which... Uh, which is the leaf crops, right? This is going to be the first uh, group. And then we're going to move from that to the fruits, to the roots, and then finally legumes, which are, and then start the process all over again. All right? So you start the first year, uh, the leaf crops. The next year, use that same area for fruit crops, which is, when I say fruit, you know, anything that comes after the flower, the tomato, cucumber, pepper, eggplant, botanically, those are all fruits. That's, that's what I mean by fruit. Uh, and then the root crops don't need that much fertilizer or, or uh, fertility in the soil. Um, and so they, they don't mind. Even after the leaf crops and root crops, fruit crops have had a turn, they can still give you a good crop. And then finally, and now you, uh, it's time to replenish. Of course, there's also the, just the question of if you, if you add compost um, generously, you don't need to be that concerned about adding nutrients, right? But let's start with the peas. There are a lot of kinds of peas, and I'm not going to be able to, uh, you know, read all these details to you. But um, uh, you know, you've got the choices of uh, um, vining or dwarf, right? Some some uh, some peas uh, don't vine; you, you, they they don't require uh, they don't require support. And then you also have the snow or snap peas, where you add you actually eat the pod, um, right? Be delicious. And there are a lot of varieties. And there's the you know, extra early, early or mid-season. There's wrinkle-seeded or smooth-seeded. All these things you will learn if you, if you become a connoisseur of, if you, if you really want to have variety, um, uh, the information is there and the seed companies will be able to help you figure out which pea varieties you want. You can pre-germinate pea seeds. All they need is water. If you put them in a, uh, if you surround them with a, like a, paper towel that's moist or something, um, or corn for that matter, the same thing. 
why would you pre-germinate? Why, why wouldn't you just put them in the soil? Well, uh, that's so that, uh, for one thing, you'll find out which seeds are duds. There might be some, and then you just throw them out. And also, uh, you don't have to plant a lot of extra. You can place them exactly where you want them. And the timing is good. You know, you, you're watching the forecast. Oh, it's going to rain tomorrow. This evening, I'm going to go put <laughs> my plants out, and then the rain will irrigate them for me. So there are a lot of varieties of beans that you can grow for the edible pod or the beans themselves that are called shell beans. Um, think about pole beans as being a heck of a lot more productive for unit space. Remember, we were talking about the best use of space and trellis. So if you have a pole bean, it keeps, and it keeps on giving and giving and giving the whole year, those pole beans. They keep on giving you more beans. So the next group is going to be the, um, uh, after, after the legumes have had a turn, now we can give the, those greens a chance. And, uh, and there's so many varieties of lettuce. Uh, uh, you can grow them in, um, I think you, you recall that, that calendar that I showed you earlier. You can plant lettuce at, at different times. In, in midsummer, for example, switch to head or romaine types, making successive sowings in shady areas for a fall harvest. They will appreciate the shade in the middle of summer or else they'll bolt, right? Um, spinach, moist, nitrogen-rich soil, buy fresh seeds every year. Okay, some, some seasons okay to save seeds, but not spinach. Um, successive plantings every 10 days until mid-May because Think about it. Do you want all your spinach to come at once? <laughs> Probably not. And then it'll start to bolt. So harvest the entire crop at the first sign of bolting. Bolting is when it sends up that stalk with the flowers in the middle, right? I love Asian vegetables. And most, for one thing, most Americans don't eat nearly enough leafy greens. And when they think about leafy greens, they're apt to think about spinach, and maybe they'll think about Swiss chard and maybe, maybe collards or whatever, but there's so, maybe kale, right? But there's so many other wonderful greens that come to us from Asia, and I highly recommend the taste of these. Uh, they grow well in cool weather. You can plant them early spring and in the fall. They can be planted thickly and harvested with scissors, okay? Edible at any stage of growth, including flowering shoots. So check these guys out. Bok choy, tatsoi, mizuna, kamatsuna. And then there's broccoli, which we're all familiar with. There are different varieties. There's a fast maturing variety for a spring crop. Um, 18 inches in each direction. Uh, let's see. All this is, I guess, fairly obvious. Put down a thick layer of organic mulch when temperatures exceed 75 degrees. Okay, they appreciate that mulch. And keep cutting the side shoots until the weather turns too hot or too cold. Now, potatoes, you can uh, keep on mounding the soil and keep on mounding and mounding and mounding. Uh, for example, you can grow them in a, in a barrel like this. Uh, and if you put the, the little, you know, the little eyes, eyes that you can, uh, of, of potatoes, cover them up. And then they'll send up shoots, the, the vegetative shoots with the leaves. You surround those shoots with soil. They'll keep growing. You surround the shoots again with soil. soil. And, and every part of the plant stem that you surround with soil, it's going to send out more roots and hence more potatoes, right? So that's why you, you get the maximum amount of potatoes if you keep on doing it. Keep on mounting or grow them in a, a bin like this. Or you can grow them in a bag, right? People do that too. All the different kinds of tomatoes there are, right? Um, you want to plant, plant the early cultivars two to three weeks before the last spring frost. But the, the others, you have to wait more. So as the vines grow, hills, hill the soil, leaves straw or compost over them to keep the developing tubers covered. Once they blossom, stop hilling up the soil, okay? And apply a thick mulch to conserve moisture and keep down weeds. Corn, plant seeds after all danger of frost has passed. Soil warms up. You've got to have a significant amount of land, by the way. To, I mean, a fairly big garden plot for corn because it's, 
you know, it, it's going to cross-pollinate um, by wind and uh, plant in blocks rather than rows to promote pollination. Remember, I was showing you how to use space efficiently and, and uh, pretend that you, you're growing in a uh, raised bed even if you aren't, that kind of idea. You don't need to plant in rows. Um, and then you thin, spread the healthy, healthiest of the three seedlings that you plant in every mound uh, and mulch or interplant with squash to prevent weed growth. This is the, the three sisters that Native Americans did. They, they planted squash and the squash would grow up the, the corn stalks and they, or rather around them and keep the soil moist and the beans, the runner beans would grow up the corn stalks. Harvest about three weeks after the corn silks appear when the pierced kernels are milky. And think about varieties. You know, the sugar, sugar corn, to me, it's bland. To me, it doesn't taste like corn used to taste when I was a young. <laughs> you know, like, and I'd rather taste the, those um, uh, heirloom varieties myself. I think they're just tastier. So now the next group is going to be what, you, what you're growing for fruit, such as tomatoes. You can start tomatoes from seed, of course. Um, you, have to, uh, you should have started earlier than now, though. Um, uh, not in, you wouldn't want to start in March. You can start earlier. Uh, and then once you've got your plants and it's time to put them in, choose a bright, airy spot. At least 10 hours of sun, tomatoes like, and leave the space between plants. Um, don't buy overgrown transplants with fruits or lush green foliage. That might look like what you want, but it's not. Bury stems up to the first true leaves. You see how this plant has been buried. You don't have to dig the hole straight down. You can you know, dig at an angle because that stem is still experiencing soil around it, right? Um, and all that soil, all that, uh, just, just like potatoes, that's going to become roots, right? Uh, water deeply but infrequently. It, it can be a mistake to water, too, uh, water lightly uh, and frequently because the plants then won't necessarily grow deep roots. They'll, they'll, they'll stay shallow rooted. So occasional watering and then deeply. Um, and you'll probably want to stake your tomatoes and you'll also probably want to cut these little guys, just pinch them off, when, you know, because the more, uh, this is what, the, the plant is just trying to start another branch there and it, you, you don't want too many branches on a tomato plant. So plant again three weeks later so all of your harvest doesn't come at once. Pick ripe but not dead ripe, according to these instructions. Best companions for tomatoes. Basel, for all these reasons, right? Repelling insect pests, improving pollination, health and flavor even. The basel seems to really bring it, bring it out in tomatoes. Borage, again, repels insect pests, improve health and flavor. And it has edible leaves itself. Carrot root, roots break up the soil around tomatoes for nutrients, air, and water. And remember the interplanting thing, so carrot and spinach and lettuce all work well uh, for that reason. And then there are some plants that repel insect pests. Chives, garlic, marigolds, mints, nasturtiums, and parsley are all good at that. The worst companions for tomatoes. Anything in the brassica or mustard family, all of these are in the same family. It, again, it's good to be a little bit botanical and know your plant families. This is called the mustard family. Cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi. They inhibit the growth of tomatoes. You don't want them that close to your tomatoes. Fennel inhibits growth. Potato increases susceptibility to early and late blight fungus. And corn attracts the tomato fruit worm, which is, or the corn earworm. If you want to save your tomato seeds, um, you put them in water and let them go get moldy. See, see how that's happening? Because what you want to do is you want to get that slimy stuff that surrounds every seed that will decompose and then you'll you, it just drain off the water. There won't be any of that slimy stuff around the seed anymore. And so the seeds will be... Uh, and I've... Uh, some people actually, uh, instead of doing that, they have a long strip of newspaper and they put, just put those slimy seeds at the spacing that they want and roll it up and save it and then put it in the, in the row uh, 
if they're starting indoors, you can do that in a, in a tray. Um, eggplants. Okay. Steadily warm growing conditions for at least three months. Consider growing in raised beds. Peppers. Boy, it takes a long time to grow peppers from seed. It really does. Uh, so start early if you want to grow them from seed. Plant where taller plants will shade peppers in the summer. They don't want, inter interestingly, they don't want too much sun, peppers, in the midsummer. They want, they appreciate that shade. Over 90 degrees Fahrenheit can wilt those peppers and cause blossoms to drop. And just like when you're buying tomatoes, remember, choose transplants with strong stems, dark green leaves, and no fruit. No fruit. You don't want to go, you know, choose one with fruit. Or start from seed. And... Uh, how about the melons and watermelons? Here's an interesting detail. Remove flowers and smaller fruits from vines after midsummer. Why do you want to remove the flowers and smaller fruits? Because they're not going to get you anything anyway. It's too late. So why not remove them and all the energy that the plant's leaves are giving to the plant will go to mature the fruits that will give you something. Okay, so that's... A nice little tip to know. Um, and this is, you know, don't forget, they want uh, warmth. Don't, don't plant them too early. And you space them for, these, these are vines. I mean, they, you know, they, they travel all over the place, right? Uh, and they sure appreciate their, that uh, fertility. So again, mulch, 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 right? Several inches of organic mulch just as the vines start to elongate. Squash and pumpkin, same idea. Uh, Remove all remaining flowers in midsummer. Same thing. Uh, okay. Um, oh, and, and by the way, there, there are uh, squ squash bees, which is a native bee. Uh, and you're going to want to encourage pollinators in your garden. I'll be talking about that. But they're, um, this, these squash bees, they're, they're cool. They have these large eyes. And because they actually are out there foraging or, you know, getting, visiting the flowers before dawn. <laughs> so that, that's, the, you know, they see better with their large eyes. A cool factoid I just learned recently. Cucumbers are vines, so give them something to climb. Uh, also protect them from heat. The plant taller crops at the southern end or at a shade cloth to block 40 to 50 percent of the sunlight during a hot spell. Add a side dressing of fertilizer after the... Now, of course, these, these uh, instructions are, might be assuming fertilizer granules. Whenever you see add fertilizer, uh, I'm asking you to think add compost. <laughs> okay, you don't need to buy fertilizer. And then uh, let's go now finally into the root group, uh, the turnips. Um, you can plant three weeks before the last frost in spring. You can plant again in midsummer, about two months before the first frost. Uh, the, you know, fall crops are often sweeter and provide a longer harvest period than spring plantings. Uh, beets, beet greens are delicious, by the way, if you've ever had beet greens. Um, uh, sow more seeds every two weeks until temperatures reach 75 degrees. Begin sowing again eight weeks before the first expected frost for a delicious fall harvest. If you like beets, follow those instructions. And again, mulch, right? They're all saying mulch. You can store for three to four months at near freezing temperatures with high humidity, which of course is in what's happening in your refrigerator. Radishes are an early crop that uh, mature in as, in as little as three weeks. So every week, as soon as you can work the soil, if you like, if you like radishes, they'll, you'll keep, you know, keep them coming so you don't have all the, the crop all at the same time. So again in late summer. So winter radishes in midsummer for a fall harvest. And there's something called a daikon radish, which is huge, much bigger than a carrot. Speaking of carrots, there are a lot of kinds. There's the blocky ball type uh, for, hand, that for heavy or shallow soil, while slender carrots need the deep, loose soil. Uh, you have to grow these from seeds. You don't, no one buys 
a flat of carrots. You'll have to grow them from seed. Um, I just, uh, a couple hours ago, I was, okay, time, that, my time is almost up. I'm, I'll have to keep on going. Uh, Pre-germinate the seeds. If they're small, in this case, a cup of water and a tablespoon of cornstarch mixed together, um, and then you, you know, leave them on the surface and they will germinate. And just the same, uh, for the same reason that, uh, and you can put them in, a, in an envelope and squeeze the gel and seed mixture into the furrow. Parsnips, oh my gosh, I love parsnips. They taste sweeter after the frost and they can be left in the ground all winter. Okay, now I'm gonna just go right through. These are all um, actually perennial onions, white multiplier onion, Egyptian or walking onion, Welsh or spring onion, chives, garlic chives or Chinese chives, wild leek, you can grow all of these things. In fact, you would be harvesting some of these spring onions now, uh, potentially, if you had them in your garden. And then there's strawberries, um, I'm not going to get into all the details of strawberry growing, but just be, keep in mind that there are day neutral types and June bearing types, and they are grown in different ways. And floating row covers are a wonderful thing to keep the pests away. Uh, and I'm just going to run through these, uh, a list of these harmful insects and what to do with them. But in a lot of cases, it, that those floating row, row covers are a great strategy. Um, so, Okay, all these are insects to watch out for. Japanese beetles, right? Um, and here are the insects that will prey on those pests. So you want to encourage them. The ladybugs, the lacewings, hoverflies or surfeit flies, predatory bugs. These are true bugs. Parasitic wasps, spiders, tachinid flies. I do a lot of that. And then there's good old birds, which love insects, right? And people often notice that there are birds in their garden. They might be worried that they're, they're harming the plants. No, they're actually helping themselves to the pest insects. Pollinators make such a difference. Look at that. The one on the left got pollen from other, another flower. The ones on the, on, in the middle and the right did not get pollen from another flower. It makes a big difference. Attract uh, beneficial organisms with native plants, trees, shrubs, wildfires, ground covers, grasses, and, and aromatic herbs such as chamomile, dill, and many mints. Uh, create a nature sanctuary for, the, for those insects, for those beneficial insects, the pollinators and the, and the ones that are predatory, and, and, uh, and for the birds, right? Uh, conservationists are asking us to plant at least 25%, at least you know, instead of having a vast lawn, uh, at least 25% for, for, uh, for our native wildlife. Uh, I want to highly recommend Massachusetts Pollinator Network. I'm a proud member of this organization. Uh, and then you, when you go to masspollinatornetwork.org, you select resources, then plant for pollinators, and you'll find a, a lot of a wealth of information. There, there, are, um, uh, YouTube, there are videos to watch, okay, to, to learn more get children to help out and, and help them to just really discover what, what an adventure it is to, uh, to plant and uh, they will become a lifelong. And, and this is uh, Richard Louv is one of my favorite authors, talks all about not just, chi not, not just children, but all of us really require for our mental health and our well-being, they, we require time in nature. And that's, this is a big reason why gardening is so popular, not just, not just to save money, not just to have good tasting, nutritious food, although those are great reasons, but we just love, it's just part of our being. You know, we are naturally of nature ourselves. We're part of the natural world. Uh, so he's created this children and nature network, which I recommend that you check out if you're, uh, if you're a parent or grandparent or uncle or aunt or whatever. And uh, this is what real food is. It's not only healthy, but it respects animals. It respects the people who are growing it. It truly nourishes producers, consumers, communities, and the earth. And so let's grow food everywhere. And thank you for coming, and thank you for your interest, and I, I wish you well out there. Thank you. Thank you.